you would like to support the work that I do and get access to exclusive content, please click the Patreon link below. Today I'm joined by the Stone Age Herbalist. He's a dissident anthropologist who's written uh, two interesting books now, uh, two interesting essay collections. Today we're going to be talking about um, one essay that I found particularly interesting, which is about Australia's deep past and Aboriginal Australia. Um, but before we get into that, um, I thought we talk a little bit about anthropology as a discipline. So I think it's fair to say that uh, most uh, academic disciplines are sort of ideologically tainted nowadays. But it seems to me that anthropology in particular, is, you know, it's particularly compromised. I, I did a unit, an anthropology unit when I was at university, and it was probably one of the most tedious experiences that I had. Um, how would you describe the current state of anthropology? Yeah, that's a good question. I think currently it's in the middle of an enormous uh, disturbance as the STEM disciplines have started to stick their raw into what was a traditional sort of humanities field um, and is really stirring the pot and bringing back all kinds of things that, that many researchers would prefer to remain sort of in the deep past. But as you say, it's it's the kind of place that attracts very at least contemporary anthropology. It attracts very sort of liberal, conscientious, open-minded um, sorts of people. And the way that the discipline has evolved since the Second World War has just led it down a path, particularly as it's incorporated more literary type theories, has led it down a path of subaltern studies, post-colonialism, um, and now into sort of very strange sort of digital anthropology and very, it, sort of a mundane areas become very, very in, interesting to these people, like the anthropology of everyday food or how people use their mobile phones and things. And it's just a very far cry away from the what people imagine anthropology should be, which is a study of ourselves and a study of the diversity of human beings and all of the myriad ways in which we've created societies, social structures, religions, and what people want from anthropology, which I think is is that, is to have a sort of encounter with the other, um, has very much been flattened in favour of this sort of strange, textual, hybrid, critical theory type approach. Um, so I'd say that's where it currently is as mm. a discipline. Yeah, World War II, I think that that definitely seems to be uh, the changing point. You think about 19th century anthropology, I guess much of that would be considered indistinguishable from like race science now. Um, and you yeah, it's largely ex expunged from the discipline, uh, only in the sense that you would refute it or critique it, but it's, it's seen as something to be embarrassed about and to be excised with great force. Mm. I seem to recall in a conversation you had with Survive the Jive uh, some years ago, you described anthropology as like a, an imperial discipline. And um, maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, that's, that's a thought that's crossed my mind for many years, that archaeology is more of a nationalist discipline and anthropology is more of an imperial discipline. And by that, I mean where you find anthropology not just contemporary or in the past several hundred years, but wherever you find it in human history, it tends to come with um, an increasing expansion of power from one power base or another, such as Rome, China, etc. And amongst the citizens of those empires, you will find people who are naturally curious and interested about the people that they are now encountering and take it upon themselves, either formally or informally, to document um people who are on their borders or further away and it and you know if you read something like Herodotus if you read Tacitus um these are proto-anthropologies um you, know, you could call them anthropologies in a sense and they, this is where people are and have always been a certain kind of person has always been interested in those beyond the borders of the frontier whereas archaeology has really come out of a an interest in the country that you that you come from and so you know archaeology is often associated with glorifying your own nation state which is why it's 
often quite cringe, you know, when it, you, know, you can be, you can find very small states that have been interested in there. You know, everything evolved from, I don't know, Serbia or everything evolved from, you know, wherever, and they take great pride in some, some glorious past. So I see the two disciplines as contrasted in that way. Mm, for sure. I, I've been very interested in, in uh, learning about anthropology, uh, in particular, um, I, w- I want to start reading more Australian anthropology because I, I want to learn about Australia's pre-colonial past. Um, mm-hmm. The problem is, of course, that Australia's pre-colonial past is uh, heavily politicized and uh, anthropologists now, um, they try to, they, they provide you with a very sanitized image of what life in Australia was like prior to the Europeans. Um, I actually, if you don't mind, there's, there's, a, there's something I wanted to share with you. So the Australian government, I think that um, they've been producing this booklet on Australian Aboriginal culture since the 1950s. And it's interesting because they, they, they you know, produce a new edition pretty frequently. And if you oh, look that's, at- That's an interesting archive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you look at, you look at the, the, the 1950s, right? And you, you, you can watch, you can see how it changes. So you've got this, um, from the 1950s, there's, there's, there was a section on fighting, for example. So I'm going to quote, if you don't mind, quickly. So this is from the 1950s edition. It says, A strict system of punishment upheld the social and religious structure of Aboriginal society. Feuding occurred mainly between clans or local groups, but camp fights were a common event. Vendettas were carried on for years between clans and could result in many deaths. The uh, main purpose of warfare was to avenge an insult or crime or to capture a, a woman, but not to take the land or other possessions of an enemy. The most serious crimes were murder, the stealing of women, incest, and ritual offenses. All right, and um, anyway, I'll just give you one. There's, there's a, one other example where I found this particularly funny. So this is from the 1950s edition. It says, supernatural forces were blamed for almost every mishap or disaster known to the aboriginals. The only corrective measures possible were through magic and ritual. And then in, in the more recent edition, <laughs> they would have changed it to, as in Western societies, there are doctors who diagnose and treat the sick. So too in Aboriginal society. Anyway, it, it's a long-winded way of kind of just pointing out that like you, you can see the image just being sanitized to actually appease modern prejudices and sensibilities. It's the same with like yeah. There's a relativism yeah. occurring there, which there is always relativism in anthropology. But you can see that there, the idea is to is to change any distinction between us and them into we all do the same thing in some form or another. It's just that it looks differently over on that side. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That definitely sounds like something that a modern anthropologist would write. Yeah, it's it's. Because it's because I think that, like you said, naturally curious people gravitate towards a field like anthropology. Because in an increasingly like globalized, homogenous world, I think people seek out like novelty, and it's yeah. so so disappointing to to have that taken from you, and then you end up just reading, oh, they were just like us, just slightly different, you know, um, as if there weren't actual substantial differences, you know. Um, I, know, I imagine that's something that you deal with a lot. You would read because because you're obviously reading old anthropologists, and then I assume you're having to read new anthropology all the time as well. And you would constantly see this sanitization going on, right? Yeah, modern anthropology is strange in that it has become attached to usually to either government or NGO departments, and so anthropology for anthropology's sake. Uh, you know, as in, I'm curious about the life ways of this tribe or this people. That isn't very common in modern anthropology. It's usually attached to some kind of project. Um, you know, something like healthcare, for example, is a is a is a big project in modern anthropology. So where you might find somebody going and doing research amongst a small outback tribe, it would be attached to probably an NGO, a charity, a government body, um, or a piece of academic research which is aimed at producing something which has policy implications. Mm. So the traditional image of the anthropologist as someone who is 
purely interested for the sake of knowledge of you know generating knowledge to pass on to other people to 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 relativize our place in the world to to provide interesting descriptions of other people in places that most people would never visit that doesn't exist anymore so for example if you try and look at papuans or neighboring uh you know neighboring group of people in papua new guinea it's almost impossible to find a contemporary anthropology of papuans outside of something like um advancing gender equality or um increasing medical outreach into remote areas so when i say it's an imperial discipline i do i do mean that because it has become attached to what is a sort of modern imperial way of going into other countries and engaging with people which is to become attached to ngos and sort of sociological s government departments yeah well, well i think in australia we do a lot of that in like the pacific islands so yes yeah. an example of like what you're talking about it, it would be like um social media habits among um yeah yeah pacific islanders and voting results or something like that you know exactly yeah yeah i, I think i did i i know yeah it, it is it's it is unfortunate i mean who who if if for for a novice someone who isn't um particularly you know educated on the topic but is um interested in learning about um they're, they're interested in learning about different customs and cultures um what's some books that you would recommend uh oh, good question um there's one that i posted a thread about not long ago by lloyd warner called a black civilization which sounds bad to modern ears but it's actually a very uh balanced um ethnographic description comprehensive description of the, the merton king or the young group people of northern australia it's from 1937 so it's obviously outdated by modern standards but it's actually a very very well balanced very well written um, and very sympathetic view of that particular group of people and gives you a good insight into the different customs and, and so on another one would be justice and warfare in aboriginal australia by um christoph uh yet i'm not sure how you pronounce the last name but that's again another interesting one it's focused just on um topics of justice and conflict between groups but if you just you know go on google scholar and you know look up uh australian ethnography and so on you can find lots of lots of very interesting small papers from jstor which are free on pdf from everything from you know, the 1850s 1860s 1890s onwards where people are more concerned with topics of language um of religion of trying to make sense of um if you go into the sort of heyday of rigorous anthropology trying to make sense of things like kinship networks which was a which was a big study australia in the sort of global anthropological literature occupies a big chunk of the study of kinship networks because aboriginal kinship descriptions and the way that they um created all sorts of terms and particular relationship types between the clan the family and and someone down to the individual is very very rich and full of lots of interesting details um so yeah there's a few books and i would just encourage you to to you know, there's a lot of free resources online if you just want to just poke your nose in even slightly you can find a lot of interesting stuff yeah do you do you have a particular interest in australia because um obviously it's um well this essay takes up a pretty significant um number of pages in your first book um or is it i i understand you're you're interested in a broad range of different um countries but would you say that you're particularly interested in australia my interest in Australia is that it's, it's one, it's an enigma, and two, that it occupies a unique position in archaeological thought, because it's essentially the only continent which we've allowed, we've allowed its current inhabitants to position themselves as the only inhabitants of that continent from time immemorial. And that, as far as I can tell, is unique amongst all the world's countries and all the world's prehistorical descriptions 
there's nobody really like the Aboriginal Australians who are given the privileged position of, you are the first and only people to have ever come to this enormous continent. Um, so just from an archaeological point of view, Australia is really strange because it has this quality of completely interior looking. It, it, most Australian archaeologists have very little interest in in whether there was contact between Aboriginal Australia and the outside. Why did the Austronesians never land in Australia? Um, and also, you know, big questions of technology, you know, things like uh, how, how did the dingo become feralized in Australia? Uh, why did the Aboriginals know to develop agriculture or pottery? Um, why was there no metalworking? Why, you know, there's just, just lots of very big questions for a continent. You know, if you look at the Earth's landmass, it's a huge portion of it, which has just been put to one side and said, one people occupied this, they stayed there, nobody else ever bothered them until about the 17th century, which is just, as far as I can tell, unique. Mm. It's called, uh, I think, uh, Tom from the Survivor Jive or whatever, I think he calls it... Uh not mushroom nationalism you know <laughs> we grew out of the soil which is kind of what it's like and it's oh, probably the most pronounced in australia the mushroom nationalism okay well anyway that that's a that's a natural segue into what we're talking about today which is your fantastic essay on the problems of australia's deep past um i thought maybe let's you've kind of already done it so forgive me if you feel like you're having to repeat yourself but let's just begin with the academic consensus um, on Australia, which is basically a group of people arrived here 65,000 years ago. Those people settled the country in one migration. They're a homogenous group um, and they have made almost no contact with the outside world during that time. Is that a fair summary of the academic consensus? Yes, that's a fair summary of the consensus. It's it has to be said, it's a fairly new consensus. Um, at one point in time, Southeast Asia was considered ground zero for human evolution, and Australia had a, a role to play in the, the thinking of how humans formed in general. But certainly since somewhere between the 60s and the 90s, a consensus was welded together that um, Aboriginal Australia was yeah as you say there was one migration stream one group of people and they have stayed there ever since and they have never really left and no one's never really bothered them that's, that's as far as it goes yeah and okay so in your essay series you talk about the fact that well like you just said that that's actually not always been the case that's not always been the view um you mentioned a guy called uh, Thomas Huxley. Uh, he didn't think that Australia was one people. He thought it was more than one people. So maybe you could uh, go into that a little bit. Yeah, it's difficult to know where to begin with the with the prehistory, but I suppose we could we could anchor ourselves with. So we have Origin of Species, is published eighteen fifty nine. We have Neanderthals discovered eighteen fifty six, and then in eighteen ninety one, the island of Java produces. What we now know is uh, Homo erectus fossils. Um, and this was very, very exciting. And most anatomists at the time thought that out of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia would be the, the place to look for the missing link, as it was considered then, between chimpanzees, apes, and human beings. And so when they went to look, they found Homo erectus fossils. And we now know even today that Southeast Asia is an absolute kaleidoscope. It's a mosaic of very strange, unusual human species. But there was a, a sort of welding together in the 50s that the, this Homo erectus species had a part to play in the first colonization of Australia. So as fossils were uncovered in Australia between say so the 1880s and the late 1960s, one of the prime theories was that, particularly these kind of robust, you know, strong cranium, big browed, thick jaw bones kind of skulls, 
that they were related or were a hybrid species or somehow were a tail end of the evolution of what was called the you know, Java man, Peking man, this um, we now call uh, Homo erectus. So that was a kind of initial hypothesis. But as you get through the 60s and, you, and archaeology starts to take Australia more seriously, you have things like the Lake Mungo excavations, it became obvious that there wasn't just one so just just as a you know as a caveat here we have to remind ourselves that this is before dna this is before radiocarbon dating uh, much of this so the primary way that we had to go on with things like stone tool typologies and comparative anatomy so you know you would measure measure the skull measure the length of the thigh bone you're looking for density you're looking for all these sort of uh, metrics that you can compare globally and start to build a picture of how these people related to one another. And the Lake Mungo fossils, when they were excavated, showed several different what you could call uh, body types. You know, one was particularly tall and very gracile. So the, the Lake Mungo fossil three is six foot five, 196 centimeters tall. Um, Sorry, can, can, I, can I interrupt quickly? Can you just explain the difference between um, gracile and, and robust? I mean, I feel like some people might not know the difference between those two things. So if you wouldn't mind just explaining those, the difference between them. Yeah, they are, they're not uh, set in stone. They're sort of relative ends of a spectrum, if you imagine, to, to people, one of whom is sort of thicker boned, uh, squatter, you know, wider chest, stronger bones, uh, more prominent brow, thicker jawline, things you would associate with, I don't know, like an American football player or something, you know, like strong, big hench builds, Neanderthal type. And then on the other end, Graysar would be someone with thinner, more delicate features, higher cheekbones, um, you know, thinner eye sockets, um, usually a kind of larger, but like slightly different shaped head. They are... I don't know, I'm trying to think of a person who would put in there. Someone like a tall, thin, I don't know, Japanese, Southeast Asian looking person, sort of more grace out, delicate featured mm -hmm. type person. Um, I don't want to, you know, offend people with sort of horrible stereotypes, but these are, when you're looking at the human skeleton, you have to be able to distinguish between different types of people, different um, phenotypes, as it were. So, yeah, as, as Australian archaeology developed and became more mature, it was aware that there were different phenotypes, different body types, different types of people. And so the question naturally arose then, how many times was Australia colonized? How many groups of people moved into Australia? The other missing piece of the puzzle, as far as they were concerned, was Tasmania, which has always been ever since it was sighted, discovered, you know, people made contact, Europeans made contact. Tasmania has always been this uh, strange, exotic end of Australia where a different group of people live. And the first theories, and there are still people today who consider it a valid theory, that the Tasmanians and the Aboriginal peoples are not the same people. They come from two completely different groups. And then, of course, that begs the question of how how on earth a different group of people got to Tasmania. And so you can find all sorts of absolutely mad theories in the literature. There's one where the Tasmanians sailed from South America across the coast of Antarctica up to Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea that the Tasmanians represent a, a sort of pygmy or a Grito people um, was very popular. Now... Or even, even to be fair, even during the sixties, seventies, and earlier, there were people who said, "No, they're just a, they're just a group of Aboriginals who became, um, who became separated due to rising sea levels," and that is currently the consensus. And I think it's correct that the Tasmanians are a group of Aboriginal people who became separated, much like uh, the Moriori off the coast of New Zealand are a group of Maoris who became separated um so yeah you had this these thoughts all swirling around between the sort of uh 
I don't know, say like 1920s, 1960s, and then later that, how many times was Australia colonised and, and, and who did it and where did they come from? Um, and we have lots of lots of more questions now because we actually know a great deal more about human prehistory. We know, for example, that there was a species of humans called the Denisovans, which nobody had ever heard of up until 20 years ago. Um, so there are lots of questions that still remain. But the idea of a two or a three, so dual hybrid, tri-hybrid, single wave, these were not fringe, but substantial debates within Australian archaeology up until about the 1970s and 80s. There have been attempts to resurrect the questions with people like Keith uh, Winshuttle. But um, as it stands, the consensus is one, you know, one, one group of people. But we are handicapped, severely handicapped, by the fact that most of these fossils and these uh, skeletal remains are very rapidly disappearing from archaeological hands. So we are, we were in a better position to answer this question 25 years ago than we currently are, unfortunately. All right, so we have this um this tri-hybrid theory of Australian migration, which is that uh, essentially the theory is that uh, there, there were separate waves of migration, three, maybe more, but then there's these, as far as I can tell, there's these three groups that are believed to have come to Australia. Um, and of course, this is a bit speculative, but there's there's the pygmy or negrito group which is i think spanish for little negro and they're a, a very small statured people something like the, the male population's 160 centimeters the female population's even shorter they have um black curly hair and then then i think the next group were called like the murrians or something and and these people are lighter skinned they have straight hair and they're of a taller stature to the pygmies. And then the final group, I think they're often called like the Carpentarians or something. And um, they're darker skinned again. I think they're normal height and um, they have straight hair. And, and anyway, so, so this is the theory that there's perhaps three separate groups in the country which have intermingled. There's been miscegenation and... Anyway, that, that there's there's potentially not one homogenous population, but three separate groups that came through three separate migrations. Uh, this is the thesis. And of course, it's is it true? Is it not? I don't know. But there's some there's some evidence that you've outlined in this essay that we're going to get into. So you already mentioned Mungo Man, which is this this um, cremated body that was found in New South Wales, believed to be 43,000 years old. Okay, and and like you said, the the bo six five, which in and of itself is kind of interesting when you consider that an indigenous people that that would be a very tall indigenous person six five. It would. Yeah, it's a, that's very yeah. unusual because they're not a particularly tall group of people, and the gra the grassile skull. Now, the grassile, like you said, um. You know, I, I I don't know. For, oh God, I hate the fact that I'm going to do this, but I'm just going to meme it. You've got you've got basically the virgin grassile skull, and you've got the Chad robust skull. <laughs> so we're going there. I hate to do it, but so this this is the old. I think you said in the essay it's the one of the oldest um, cremated bodies that's been found. Is that correct? It might be the oldest. Yeah. 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 And then we have so, so there's, there's Lake Mungo One and there's Lake Mungo Three. So Mungo One. Is the cremated body and Mungo 3 is the Grayson Build 65. So obviously you wouldn't be able to tell very much from the cremated. The Lake Mungo 1 was cremated once, then smashed up, and then looks to have been cremated a second time. So someone really wanted to burn this body. Mm, yeah. And then but we do have the remains of one. And then you mentioned this, well, you mention a lot that will just for the sake of simplicity, there's this other body that's found in Cow Swamp. For those of you who are in Victoria or New South Wales, this place is along the Murray River. So common like holiday spot for people. And there's a difference, right? We find that it has this robust skull. Now this in and of itself already raises some questions, right? I, I don't know what the height is, but 
we find phenotypically, right, these are very, very different to the point where people who compared the two skulls thought they were so different that they could, in fact, be different people altogether, different peoples, you know? Yeah, I mean, Cow Swamp was considered, even in the 1970s, to be... I mean, you could quote from Thorne and McCumber, 1972, who say verbatim, quote, an almost unmodified Eastern Erectus form, specifically that of the Javan Pythanquipines. So he was basically saying that this is either Homo erectus or something very like it. Hmm. Oh, that is very inch. That, that I find that so crazy, that thought. And then there was a point, and um, I don't know if it was with the cow swamp or if it was Mungo Man, but um, the geneticist began to get into it. And wasn't there a prominent geneticist who was convinced that they had found genetic evidence that uh, it was, in fact, a Homo erectus? Is that correct? Um, so the, the, the link between Homo erectus and modern and ancient Aboriginals is very difficult and tenuous. I can't recall... So there, there is something called like a, a ghost or an archaic population marker um, in certainly in even in some modern Aboriginals, which is not unusual. Most modern humans have some archaic human remnant, be it Denisovan, Neanderthal, or something else. Um, one of the big questions which has been left over from the Victorian anthropology is, and has been a working hypothesis, is that uh, Aboriginal Australians unlike, say, Europeans who have Neanderthal admixture, East Asians who have a Denisovan admixture, that um, Aboriginal Australians have a Homo erectus admixture. Um, I can't recall any genetics paper that has been able to prove that definitively, partly because Homo erectus has not been uh, genetically sequenced because it's, it, the fossils lie way beyond the boundary for DNA preservation. But something... One of the questions is, you know, who did these people mix with? Um, and if they mixed in a slightly different way, or if there were species around in Southeast Asia, which are no longer around because we have, uh, you know, Homo floresiensis, we have potentially Denisovans lasting in Papua until the beginning of the Holocene. Um, you know, we have all sorts of different species hanging around. So, yeah, exactly who has made it into the, the modern Aboriginal admixture is a difficult question. And then we also have the difficult question of modern Aboriginals versus Pleistocene populations, so Lake Mungo people. Are these two people descend? You know, this is the big question. Are modern Aboriginals descendants of those people who were found at Lake Mungo? The question has been settled certainly politically. They are given full rights over those skeletons, but it's not obvious to, to me or to, to anyone who cares to look that they should have the right to that. Um, you know, if, if you found a paleolithic skeleton in any other part of the world, the people who currently live on that territory would not be given the right to say that it was their ancestor. In fact, that would be, that would be ridiculous. Mm. Um, Lake Mungo 3 was sampled um, back in 2001 by um, Adcock et al. So this is before genetics was, has the sort of resolving power that it does today. But the mitochondrial DNA of Lake Mungo 3, they suggested in that paper, and this is a, you know, a peer-reviewed publication, you can look it up, 2001, Adcock et al. suggested that Lake Mungo 3's mitochondrial DNA has no connection, essentially, to, to the deepest parts of um, of the human lineages. So they were basically saying that he was not related to, he or she were not related to any African person, which mm. would which would completely you know, vindicate the idea of sort of out of Southeast Asia or even out of Australia. But, of course, that was 2001. There was a re re-examination of that in 2016, which said, no, this is a contamination, which is a huge issue in, in DNA studies, particularly back in the early 2000s when it was less sophisticated. Contamination is a massive problem in DNA studies and the Tim Hewpink and colleagues essentially said that no, that's not true, but they did find this haplogroup S2 
which isn't really found anywhere else, um, suggested that um, you know Aboriginal separation in Australia is so deep, so profound, and so old that you know they have a set of genetics which is which is un- which is unique to them. Um, but they they suggest that the population when it arrived was so is so old that it had much more genetic diversity than you'd expect in a modern population and therefore would account for the difference between all the gracility and the robustness and the different heights and so on. So it's an explanation. I don't, it's not fully satisfying by any stretch at all. And unfortunately, we can't test Lake Mungo again because it has been sealed up and secretly hidden somewhere on Aboriginal land. So we will never get a chance to look at it again, unfortunately. Yeah, the what I said before about um, the geneticist, I was actually, what you just relayed then was what I was meaning to refer to. The fact that um, genetic testing done on Mungo Man suggested that, to, to simplify greatly, that Mungo Man was sort of unlike anything we had seen. That's essentially what he was saying, right? Um, that it yeah. bore very little relation to what we typically, you know, yeah, to, to the people we are today, to, to yeah. So... Um, all right, cool. So we just from that fossil evidence alone, I think that should get people thinking, all right, we've got this 43,000 year old um, body. Um, there's a lot about it that's unusual. The fact that it's six five, the fact that it has this that it has a, a, a gracile skull and then we look at um, different skeletons and they have robust skulls and and, 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 and they're very different. So the fossil, fossil remains already should get you thinking hmm what has this has this continent only been occupied by one group of people is that it and then i think the next thing that could be interesting to talk about is the the pygmies um you uh have already mentioned keith windshuttle who obviously wrote this fantastic sort of summary of the situation um but that for a long time um it was believed and, and, and recognised that there was a pygmy population in Australia, clo- in, in northern Queensland, close to Cairns, and that they were believed to have been um, in this country for a long, long time. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the pygmies, I guess? Yeah, so pygmy, pygmoid stature, I think as it would be referred to, is essentially where a human population becomes diminutive, shrinks, which is not um, not unique to human species. Lots of animals will become will will become smaller um, given the right environmental conditions. There are pygmy elephants, pygmy hippos, and so on. Um, the two main existing groups of modern pygmies are found in Central Africa, particularly in the Congo, and in Southeast Asia. There are a number of what's known as Negrito peoples. Um, they're found from Thailand and the Philippines and so on. There's a number of different... The question of their relationship to one another has always been, you know, are they one group of people? The answer is probably not. Um, they're probably, it's probably an archaic mechanism whereby these populations shrink over time, depending on their circumstances. It's usually to do with uh, you know, levels of resources in the environment. But we don't actually know because it's not in you know, a very well studied topic. Um, the the thought has always been from the Victorian period onwards. In fact, you can go back to Herodotus, to the Egyptians, to fossil record that pygmy populations were more widespread than they are today. So there's there's a lot of suggestion that they you know they were encountered by ancient Egyptian dynasties that large numbers of them lived in East Africa. We know from the fossil record that there were pygmies in Taiwan. Pygmies in Palau, Micronesia, and so there there are photographs of people like Joseph Birdsell in in parts of Australia where these very small, certainly very small statue people. Um, I mean, this this man is 140 centimeters tall. Mm. Picture from 1938. It's relatively you, know, you can find it online. It's not some secret esoteric wisdom. It's easy to find that picture. Um, and that formed part of the hypothesis that, if not the Tasmanians, then other peoples in Australia were Pygmy or Negrito peoples, if they weren't directly descended from 
those in Southeast Asia, then then something had happened in Australia, or they could be related to those people. That was very much just sort of thrown out by the time we hit the 1960s and 70s as just a kind of Victorian, white man, fantasy, crass, racialistic, um, you know, colonialist, you know, horrible, objectivizing the human body sort of approach to dealing with Australian prehistory. And so, yeah, that, that subject has kind of been lost to time and only people like Keith Winshepel and other, you know, random bloggers like myself are really interested in the subject. But for a, for a time, it was certainly one of the the strands of the, the tri-hybrid theory that there was this this uh, Negrito or pygmy people who lived in Australia. I actually I actually started up reading like a thesis on the tri-hybrid theory published. I, I was actually trying to get it up, but I I'll um I'll send it to you later on. It was published by someone at um a, a U- University of Adelaide. And look, I don't know how reputable it was, but they were talking in a way that was, uh, I I liked it because it made it chronological and easy to understand, but it's probably a gross oversimplification. But their theory was they suspected and they cited evidence uh, or they cited at least academics from back in the day, obscure academics. They suggested that potentially what happened was that this pygmy population came first and then after that, what they called the Murrayan population, which was the lighter skinned indigenous people now with straight hair, they came. And then the idea was the theory. And I think that this may have also been believed in the Victorian era was that those pygmies were pushed um, in like basically pushed out. So pushed uh, into Tasmania, um, pushed to the edges, you know, the fringes uh, and, and into less hospitable areas. Um, I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is speculative, of course, but it you know it would match the, dis- the descriptions that we know from contemporary and um, historical pig populations that they tend to be marginalised. They tend to either be you know so somewhere like the Congo. There's this strange relationship between farmers and what are now euphemistically called rainforest hunter-gatherers, which means pygmies, um, where they have this sort of mutualistic relationship of they are the forest dweller, animistic, magical, to be slightly feared, but also to be hated group of people who can provide them with bush meat, honey, you know, things from the forest. Um, but they're not. They are their sort of uh, barbarians in, in a sense, and they're also they have they have this sort of dual function where they they appear in stories of sort of powerful magic, of powerful animistic magic. They can appear in stories of like uh, you know a king might marry a pygmy woman or something and give birth to a you know a strange type of um, magical being or something. Um, but they also don't like them, and so modern pygmies are you know greatly shunned disliked, marginalized, even killed um, in Central Africa. So, yeah, it's it. we don't have, unfortunately, any firm evidence such as a fossil of a big person, such as we do in Taiwan or Palau, to say, yes, this group of people, you know, with this X radiocarbon date, they arrived here at this time, so we can definitively say this population, but it it will always stir up something in the imagination for people who are interested in these these questions of, wow, there are these photographs of people who look exactly the same as modern pygmy peoples. Where did they come from? Mm. You know, and why are there these stories of uh, later Aboriginal arrivings destroying their rock art or pushing them back into the into the rainforest or you know removing them from their lands? These are all speculative interesting but unfortunately we're the only people who really talk about it (laughs) yeah well i was thinking obviously one of the things that makes it difficult is in tasmania the tasmanians were more or less exterminated right they they were killed off in a way that was um unusual as compared with any description you have of tasmanian aboriginals 
is that they were very distinct culturally from mainland Aboriginals. And that's a that's something that you'll read in just any book, right? That's a sort of mainstream historical fact that um, the Tasmanian Aboriginals had a very distinct culture, but obviously they they were um, ultimately exterminated in a, 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 during a yeah the frontier wars or whatever. Um, but the fact that in the nineteenth century. You mentioned that it, it, it was widely accepted that they were distinct from mainland Australians, right? That that was a widely held view, was it not? Yeah, I mean, from the moment Tasmania was discovered up until, well, even up until today, there's always been this question, particularly in the 19th century, of, of why Tasmania is different from the rest of Australia. Um, yeah, and unfortunately we have... We have the archaeological evidence to go on. We have, you know, we have written testimonies and diaries from the time. Um, but we don't, what we don't have are any, um, you know, sort of living Tasmanians, as it were. Yeah. Do you, do you <laughs> of, have the, a... of the original variety, anyway. Yeah. Of the original you... sort of representative of the people before they were discovered by, by Europeans. Because modern Tasmanians are like many indigenous groups around the world, an admixture of Europeans and people who no longer really exist. Do we have phenotypical or, or fossils or things? Like, do we know what their statue was like? Do we have physical descriptions of what um, the Tasmanians were like? Good question. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember. That would be a good one to, to research. And certainly you could find contemporary descriptions of them. Um, things like their hair texture, their stature, and of course their way of living was considered different, as you said, to, to Australians. One of the one of those things like um, the question of can pygmies create fire has always been a Victorian-esque topic. So there was, there's always been this theory that, that they are so low on the evolutionary chain that they never actually invented fire, there's always been this question of Tasmanians were never able to, to create fire. It's not strictly true, but there certainly were major differences between the way that Tasmanians moved to, to mainland Aboriginals, which is probably not surprising given that it's a, you know, it's, it's an island with very small resources. And it may be as, you know, as a, a sort of a compromise between the two theories that the Tasmanians have been isolated for so long that they were undergoing a process of you know, reducing their stature in order to cope with the minimal amount of resources that they had available to them. Yeah, I, 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 I'm Tasmania is not a very hospitable place. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's, this is the yeah. last outcrop before you know you hit Antarctica, really. This is. Yeah. Not really what many people consider, you know, like the nice parts of Australia, is it? No, not at all. Um, so we also had this, another thing that I found fascinating was this idea of like a Dravidian population. So, so we, we have, again, I'm repeating myself, but I like to just come back. So we're coming back and we're all on the same page. It's like the idea of potentially three waves, potentially a pygmy population coming um, the um, Murrayan population, and then there was this Carpenterian, which I think. Oh God, now now it's getting a bit confusing. But but I'm trying to say I think that the last the last group is is the last group this Dravidian South Indian population. Is that the that that um Huxley spoke about? Um, well, we have to we have to keep in mind that there has been more than one trihybrid theory. So yeah. one version of the trihybrid theory suggests that there was either a very great style people who moved first like Lake Mungo who were then replaced by a more robust papal in stature or vice versa that the more robust population came first and the great style population came second or this this idea of a, a pygmy negrito followed by what you might think of as more aboriginal perhaps or papal then a later and we are talking much later holocene arrival from india which is a another version of the trihybrid theory. Um, yeah, I think that's which, why I was getting... One which is definitely more studied today than most of the others, that's for sure. Mm. So when so so um let's go with that 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 later 
try hybrid theory. Okay. Um, and, and the idea of this, this, um, this late arrival of potentially like a Dravidian South Indian type of people. Um, so what evidence do we have for that? Good question. So we have a mixture of, so if we could go back to Huxley, um, we have the case built in between 1865 and 1817 that Huxley built that the and Australians anatomically comparatively between their, their skulls and their body type and so on, that they were um, related to one another. So you have this group, the Australoids, which to some extent we still keep with Apple and Australoids, that there are Dravidian people who belong in the Australoid category or in some version of that. that that's a, a, a number of uh, Indians have moved to Australia. Exactly how that works is a little bit unsure, but that was one of Huxley's proposals anyway. That did make a comeback with Joseph Birdsell's work. Uh, see, as you've said, this the trihybrid. One of one strand of the trihybrid hypothesis is that a Dravidian group moved into Australia sometime around three to five thousand years ago. So there have been multiple genetic studies. Uh, I'd emphasize that they're not of the highest quality. Most of them are early 2000s, and they're looking at very small signals within the genome. We're not, we're not talking about a whole, you know, whole genome studies like we do today. We're talking about taking bits of it, what they call like microsatellites or SMPs, it's of mitochondrial DNA. So there have been what was, uh, f at least four, five, I think, actually five papers now that have suggested with some limited DNA evidence that um, there's a connection between um, modern Aboriginal peoples and South Indians. And the connection would be that there was a movement from South India into Australia somewhere between five three to five thousand years ago so it's tenuous but it, it, you know there is certainly a bit more evidence for it than some of the other some of the other um, theories and doesn't it doesn't um, that coincide with does that not coincide with the introduction of the dingo or is that unrelated well okay so this is where we get into the wider topic of uh, even if you are the most committed to the theory that there was one group of people who entered Australia and uh, since they've never been contacted until 17th century, even if you're absolutely committed to that, you have to make an exception for the dingo. You just don't have a choice about that because the dingo was, is obviously not an Australian animal and it arrives into Australia somewhere between eight and a half to three and a half thousand years ago. So I think the earliest fossil in Australia is about three and a half thousand years. Um, but genetically and morphologically, they split from the New Guinean singing dog somewhere around eight and a half thousand years ago. So you, you, even if you are utterly committed to this idea that they were just one more, if totally unconnected, somehow the dingo makes it into Australia. So there has to be contact at some point in some way between the Aboriginal populations and the outside world. So that's one thing that has to happen around, you know, around about three and a half to five, let's say, thousand years ago. The other very strange phenomenon in Australia, or multiple sort of phenomena that all seem to occur roughly at the same time, is that there is... Almost all Australian languages, about 80, 85% of Australian languages, all come from one single yeah. family. The, the, so the 300, the, what is it? It's the Pama, languages. The Pama, Pama Nyungan language, Pama Nyungan language group. And I was actually, if you don't mind, That's right, yeah. I, I want to make sure I understand this because this is your like wheelhouse. You're um, much more educated on it, but, I, but I'm going to try and summarize it to see if I understand it. You can tell me if this sounds right. But oh, I found this very, very interesting. So, you know, you, you have a, 
a language family group. So an example of this would be Indo-European, right? German, French, mm -hmm. um, even Hindu, right? Like these, these, the, oh, sorry, Hindi. Um, these languages all um, at some point were, were the same, right? The idea is if you go back far enough, they all stem from the same core language, right? And that basically Hammer Nungen, which is the most prevalent uh, language spoken in Australia. It, like you said, it's of the 400 languages that, that are spoken, in a, that were spoken, obviously a lot of them are dead now, um, 306 are from this Pam Pama Nyungen family. Um, but then the, the interesting thing, which you were about to go into before I interrupted, um, is that in, in Northern Australia, in, in, in the far North, we find these non Pama Nyungan languages. So what I, the reason I wanted to see if I understand this right is you, in, in the same way that a German and, um, someone from France may be able to, under, or, or, or a better example might be an Englishman and, and a Frenchman. Like they'll be able to pick up each other's languages much quicker because they're similar in many ways. They share many words. And you could say something similar about the Pama Nyungan um, language family, right? So an indigenous person who speaks one of these 306 languages is going to be better able to understand the language because they're very similar. But then what, what you say is in your essay is that there's this language family. So roughly, let's say like 90 different languages in the very far north, which is from a totally different language family. So it might be like um, comparable to like Indo-European and Sino-Tibetan or something. I, I don't know if that's an actual good comparison, but you get my point. Is that yeah, a better word? Sorry? Indo-European languages and Basque. Would yeah. Be a better comparison. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so, but, but the point is that, um, again, like th that's one of those things which definitely makes you think like that. That's unusual. That's that's weird, right? That, um, it, it definitely makes you question the homogeneity thing, doesn't it? Yeah. It is. It's strikingly, it's almost unknown outside of Australian archaeology. Like you have to really dig into. Australian archaeology to some degree to even find out that this is a, a thing. Um, you know, that most languages in Australia come from the same language family, and not just the same language family, but, you know, the, the study of linguistics, of glossochronology, of... There are rules within linguistics which tell you, which, which make you able to assess the relationship between one language and another, and there are rules for how letters and sounds within languages change from one form to another and so you can by applying those rules move backwards in time and say these languages um, are related to one another and not only that you obviously have things like um you know do certain words appear in, in all these languages um do certain concepts appear in all these languages do words for particular objects which only appear in certain times do they appear in those languages so there are lots of ways of looking at the language with a forensic eye to try and understand how it broke away from the rest of this family. And the consensus from the few scholars that have really studied this is that this, this wasn't a gradual, smooth diffusion of, you know, just uh, maybe a lingua franca or something that spread out. This was a sharp, definitive break at one point in time whereby there was an expansion of people from around about North Australia to the rest of Australia in some way or another. And what we have discovered from, from genetics is that when you find something like a massive linguistic spread, it's accompanied by a massive spread of people. Mm. So the other, the other sort of piece of evidence we have to go along with this is that of the two major tool types, which are called backed and bifacial points, which is you know, mythic terminology, but basically said so two different ways of making stone tools. The majority of one type is only found within the Palm Yungan family, who are in that territory, and the remainder is found in the Northern Territories where the non Palm Yungan languages are spoken. So between that and things like um, new technologies for detoxifying root plants, for processing plants, the spread of the dingo, we we have 
now really very concrete piece of evidence to say that round about let's just look at my so somewhere about five to six thousand years ago so let's call it three thousand bc a huge internal migration within australia must have taken place um and it, it spread very rapidly and it conquered basically the rest of australia apart from the northern territories mm. um, where the original languages were spoken so if we if having established that you then have to ask the question what prompts a massive internal expansion like this that is a really difficult question you know is it, is it climate related um is it to do with outsiders which is what some people would like it to be um is it to do with the introduction of something from the outside um we don't know because no one has really studied this very mm. hard nobody really knows very much about this all we can say is that you know uh we have the dingo new stone tool type new ways of processing plants completely new languages all happening roughly at the same time yeah which mate. is extremely strange um especially if you're absolutely committed to the idea that there is no connection between australia and the outside world at this point then you know something pretty dramatic must have happened but we also have the bingo so there's no smoking gun here to say who it was or that you know we know exactly what happened but we have this evidence this, this pretty rich you know and diverse set of evidence from linguistics from archaeology and so on to say that um there was a major change in australia um during this time period yeah so there is actually something that that i wanted to share with you um dampier william dampier who obviously visited first englishman to visit australia um and he visited western australia the northern parts of western australia and i think he may have visited parts of arnhem land or the northern territories what we'd call it now anyway he um he, he encountered indigenous people and obviously wrote a his famous unflattering account of them but um i think that he, he obviously gave a um a physical description of what they looked like and um he described them as dark skin and and curly haired and i and um anyway when banks and cook came you know over 100 years later and they're on the east coast right very different part of australia they um that they, they they look from a distance and banks goes and says you know they were very dark skinned with kept curly hair but when he actually gets to um the shore when he when he when he gets on uh, you know they land he realizes that um that's not in fact what they look like at all and that dampier's description of them has totally like shaped his vision and and he and he even goes and makes a note of it back this is joseph banks he goes and says like um, Dampier had had such an influence on me that he, that it shaped the way that I viewed them. But up close now, I realize that it's not the pe same people that he described. And this seems super relevant to what we're talking about because Dampier, I don't know if I'm getting this completely right. I'm sort of speculating a little. But in those um, areas of the country where they don't speak um, the, 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 Pama, the Pama Nyungan language, right, that's roughly where Dampier was. He's in those areas where they speak a completely different language, right? And they have a different, they're, they're different phenotypically. And, and we don't just have to base this off that account. Um, Tyndale and um, what was the other guy that he worked with? You've mentioned his name, Joseph. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so th I think that they did extensive, um, I, what's it called? A um, when you do like physical anthropology, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're getting people to weigh them. You're weighing people. You're looking at their height because they have this tri hybrid theory, right? So they thought what we'll do is we'll go around and we'll look at people in different parts of the country that I think they were from Adelaide, right? But they went up to Northern Queensland. They went to Western Australia and they're getting people to weigh themselves. They're checking their height. And, the um, physical anthropological data that they got led them to believe that there were in fact three separate people because the um, heights were varying so drastically, the weight, the the things like you know the crane, like 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 the the face, etc. All of these things were varying. So you think again, it, it, it leads you to speculate. Uh, you were just talking about this explosion of 
of a new language, this Pamanyungan um, language family. When, when did it start to explode and spread across the continent again? It was roughly 3,000? Uh, yeah, somewhere about three, between 3 to 2 BC. So five to 6,000 years ago. Yeah. So and it's hard because these, these are estimates based on the linguistics. So you have to, you have to instead of using the archaeological evidence there, you have to go with, you know, um, working backwards through through linguistic rules to suggest when the the language you know, sort of was originally in one form as opposed to diversified into a family. Um, but of course, we also have the stone tools and you know other bits of evidence as well. So somewhere around three thousand BC. Mm. Well, it, it, it's again that that that's definitely it, it's it's interesting because I guess if you wanted to be bold and go and make a hypothesis you would go and say that spread of language and the spread and the introduction of the dingo it could it's it's a hypothesis you could test it could actually be the arrival of a, of a new people that began to spread across the continent but perhaps um didn't they weren't as prolific within the northern territory because i guess it's uh, not as inhabitable but you know that that's not that's a hypothesis that you can test isn't it it is, but it, it, like I said, there isn't a smoking gun here. It's, it's very difficult to know if, if the Pamanyungan expansion was prompted by an um, external contact, um, why would there have been this expansion? And also, why, why do most modern Aboriginals not? You know, if, if there's some kind of Dravidian expansion, why do they not genetically, you know, appear to be basically South Indian in origin. Um, and why why would something like contact with a group of people from the outside necessarily cause a stone tool revolution which has nothing to do with with the civilization which the South Indians had just come from? Why would they have brought the dingo with them and the dingo is from New Guinea? There's just lots of things that don't add up. Do you know what I mean? So there's it's, there isn't like a, a nice neat story here. What we have is just lots of lots of elements to something very confusing um, that says there's a strong possibility of external contact, but we don't know how, why, the scale of it, or why, or what the mechanism was by which contacting new people led to a massive explosion across the entire continent of new people and new new tools and new ways of living. They just don't, it doesn't follow one from the other that that would, that would happen or how it would happen. Well, I think may, maybe what it would be interesting to get into is um, how people, like, you know, the retort, because um, I think that in the Windshuttle article towards the end, um, he actually sort of talks about the, uh, so, so um, Norman Tyndale and, oh, forgive me, Joseph, what's his name again? That's all. <laughs> yeah, geez, keep forgetting it. Anyway, so that so they publish this um, tri-hybrid theory and they have lots of evidence um, that su su they, they, they do have evidence to suggest that phenotypically Australia is very diverse, right? You've got huge yeah. um, oscillations in height, uh, in weight, in in cranium, things like that. And um, basically, I think the way that the academic establishment responds is by saying they've um, just basically evolved to a particular environmental niche. And they said this with um, the the pygmies, right? They said, you know, um, if you if you look at the environment they're in, like the, the rainforest, it, it could be, it, it's very similar to the Congo. So it could be some sort of environmental adaptation or something like that. But um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it seems like something that definitely needs to be interrogated more, doesn't it? Because I don't know if that's an adequate explanation because you think, well, there's there's other indigenous people living in rainforests that, that they're not pygmies. They, they haven't, there hasn't been this reduction in size. But it, it is interesting that the pygmy thing, that, that that happens to elephants as well. Like, aren't elephants in the Congo also, um, like, there's instances? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the question of how and why animals pygmify is, is a huge one, you know. Um, 
and in rainforests, lots of animals there are extremely small. For mm. their, you know, relative to to the other members of their family outside that rainforest, it could be something to do. Islands are the other one, you know, where where things become smaller. Dwarf hippos, dwarf uh, elephants, and so on. Um, it, it's something to do with the relationship between the calories and um, and the genetics available to switch off basically like the excessive growth hormone to you know but exactly how that works is yeah is not really very no one's really very interested in doing it it's quite an unsavory topic if you went and proposed you know you wanted a research <laughs> ground because you wanted to understand why kidneys are the way they are you would just sort of be frowned at quite heavily <laughs> it was just Maybe. Just Maybe we can go and do take any boxes. <laughs> so social media habits among pygmy populations in northern Queensland. I reckon that's maybe what you need to do to get the <laughs> Um yeah, no. Yeah, so it, but the, the question of why why phenotypic diversity in Australia is a big one because obviously if there is this small group if you're expecting or your your theory is predicated the idea that there were a small group of people entered Australia. 70,000 years ago and have stayed ever since. I don't know why you'd expect that population to be as widely diverse as the fossil record shows, because even if you go to parts of the world where you have the highest genetic diversity, like the Sun or the Hadza, these are not people who vary so widely that one of them would be mistaken for a Homo erectus and the other one for a six foot five, you know, gracile, tall, thin person. But it doesn't, that doesn't add up um, and never, never has. Um, and it has only added to the mystery of, of things like, so we have all sorts of tantalizing glimpses of, you know, bits of contact from the outside world, things like, uh, you know, Madagascan eggs, hints of horticulture, hints of um, stories of meeting strangers, um, all these sorts of things where just, you, there's nothing you can grasp that says this is definitive, but there's just something there that says, mm, it's not quite right, Do you know what I mean? Well, it's, it's, there's enough there to suggest um, further inquiry is necessary. Um, do you buy Keith Winshuttle's explanation that largely this inquiry is not being done because, well, well, due to political reasons, or do you think it's because there really isn't enough there to warrant further investigation? It's a mix of things. I think there there is a... The, the way that academia in parts of the world where you have anthropology and archaeology and you also have living indigenous peoples, particularly in the atmosphere, Canada, America, New Zealand, Australia, where you have disciplines like anthropology and archaeology butting up against people who are potentially, and in some cases are definitely, the descendants of people who you are studying. You end up with political and social compromises and in some sense you have to because you know you unless you are talking about you know to completely subjugating a population and saying everything culturally that was yours is now ours and we can read tombs with impunity etc etc mm. you you have to make some kind of compromises but the compromise that's been made in australia i think is significantly deeper wider and and I think is more problematic than elsewhere. You know, with New Zealand, this is a fairly open and shut case. One group of people moved in the last few hundred years. North America, you know, obviously huge continent, many streams of migration, many different people who have no interest or had no knowledge of one another prior to European contact and would never claim to be related to one another. Um, Whereas Australia is in this unusual position where when as pan-indigenous sort of um, social movements in the, in the 60s developed, all Australian Aboriginal people were in some sense in solidarity with one another. Maybe it was to do with the numbers of them or for whatever reason. And 
collectively decided upon they were all one people and therefore they all came at the same time and are all related to one another in one family and that has put anthropology and archaeology on the back foot to the point where we don't have the skeletal record that we, we need we don't have the right or the ability to excavate where we need to and so it has been forced down another channel you know kind of like blocking a river with a dam it's been forced down another channel whereby the interest in it has has to come with this collaborative and sort of sociological approach to uh, modern aboriginal peoples and that has obviously not only handicapped archaeology in what it wants to do but it means that certain questions are simply not on the table um questions like are you all are all of you related to one another it just simply isn't on the table and so i think it will take it will either take a huge rupture in that paradigm or it will take people from outside australia to to make that point well i guess another it, this is sort of similar to what i just asked but take the example of uh mungo man um he was repatriated right given back to the traditional owners of of that land and uh, they're not allowing archaeologists to access him, right? Do you think that that's being done? Because I, I think you know more about this, but but often um, bodies will not be given to geneticists or anthropologists for what is in fact political reasons because it destroys a narrative. Um, do you think that Mungo Man's being kept from geneticists and anthropologists for political reasons or for genuine religious reasons? Difficult question. I think the I think the fear has always been there, and in some senses, there there will be parts of. So in in all these countries, there has always been parts of a vocal minority, particularly on the right, who will use fractures or splits or disputes within indigenous groups to suggest that they were either not the first people there or that they were in some way culpable in their own removal from the land so i'm not a i i sit neutral on this on the kind of the political question i'm not really interested in the modern politics of it other than how it how it actually plays out i'd like to think of myself in this as my sort of online persona is not engaging in that discussion i'm more interested in the search for truth um, but it's certainly true that, for example, with the with the Moriori genocide in in New Zealand, where the Maori sailed the Chatham Islands and destroyed the Moriori people who were their cousins, it has been used by some on the New Zealand right to essentially say that uh, you know that they don't deserve the land. And similar claims have been made since the Victorian era up to now that many different Aboriginal populations were not the original owners of the land and therefore don't have the right to live on it, to own it now in whatever way. And one of the ways that that has played out is that there is a fear amongst Aboriginal peoples and amongst the sort of NGO charities that represent them in some ways, the sort of advocacy groups that represent them, that further investigation into their history, particularly sort of very deep Pleistocene history, would it is only motivated or would have the outcome that it would disenfranchise them from their lands. And so they will, uh, we're at a point where they just will not countenance any study really of, of what they consider to be their ancestral remains. I think that it is wrong. I think, as in, I think it's intellectually bankrupt to say that you can look at a, a skeleton from 40,000 years ago and say that the people who live on that land now are the owners of that. I think that's that's not correct. That wouldn't be allowed anywhere else in the world. But obviously Australia has its own politics, the indigenous tribes themselves have their own politics, and so we're at the point where they would rather let skeletal remains disintegrate in the rain than let archaeologists study them which is quite extreme and so i can only think that they're motivated by a mixture of fear that the results would not be 
that either they think the results are politically motivated and so they're not coming from objective academia or objective academic study, or they genuinely fear what the results might be, you know? Um, I think I, 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 as to the religious one, I, that, that is a more difficult question because it's very hard there to disentangle what people's motivations are, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. It's, you know, it's very, very difficult. So I, I just can't, I can't say, all I can say from the outside is it looks very much like that they have been increasingly motivated to withdraw and have been given the right to withdraw these remains from academic study. And so as they have been given the right, they have withdrawn them. Mm. I don't think I don't think it would make a difference because you, you cite the example of New Zealand where it's a clear example that within, well, not exactly recent history, but relatively recently recent history, it's like, yes, you um, genocided a population not too long ago, right? But that doesn't Absolutely. make a difference. It, it makes no difference politically, right? And I don't think it would matter if it, if it was found out that, oh, hang on a second, uh, Mungo Man is something different altogether. I don't think that would change the political situation. What I do think would, I, I think something that's way more politically charged, which it shouldn't be, would be the question of whether um, Indigenous people have mixed with um other, you know, d different sort of human groups like um, Homo erectus, as you were mentioning. I feel like, because obviously- That would be much more explosive, definitely. Yeah, I, I could see why that would be way more politically charged, but it shouldn't be because obviously Europeans, we all know that uh, mixed with Neanderthals and have have um, some ne Neanderthal DNA, but um, I think that that would be super politically charged. I don't see why it needs to be politically charged. I'm with you. I don't think it would make a difference politically for them. But um, it would be very interesting. It's such a shame. It's actually a real shame that we probably will not get to. Because am I right in thinking that now there's been huge advant advances in genetics and um, what we could do with that um, corpse now would be oh sorry um, that skeleton now would be very different from what we were able to uh, yeah honestly it's, it's absolutely tragic i mean from yeah. just from the genetics point of view the loss of prehistoric aboriginal remains to to our, to our study is just so tragic because the resolution power and the sequencing power and the comparative power in terms of how many genomes you can do at one time and how many you can compare them against and the data sets you can build uh, you know, it's night and day compared to the early 2000s. Um, yeah. The things that we could do with those those genomes is an indescribable loss for global archaeology. Um, and when I read that piece in, in the book about this very question where they said that, you know, the, the several sets of remains had eroded out of the site and had just been covered with, you know, a piece of tin roof until they disintegrated from the rain to an archaeologist that is just heartbreaking mm. you know the, the pure you know almost complete remains from say 18 to twenty five thousand years ago are, are rare difficult to find they're not usually intact to see one and then to watch it just turn to dust is just yeah i, I can't even describe to you how painful that is because you said that is it, wait that's the oldest skeletal remains is that right M well, we don't know. I mean, the Mung Mungo Man, Lake Mungo One, seems to be uh, somewhere about twenty thousand. Lake Mungo Three, which is obviously the Grey Sal Six from Five, you know, needs to be genetically tested, could certainly be the oldest. I mean, they're, they're thrown around dates between thirty to fifty thousand years, mm. so that could certainly be the oldest, and would give us an you know an unprecedented insight into. Wow migration into australia because phenotypically that is nothing like the australian papuan peoples who currently occupy you know that entire swath of southeast asia that is that is crazy to think about isn't it that i mean you kind of ima imagine because i think it was discovered in the 1960s right and imagine it if, was, yeah. if they had um the genetic like if they were able to do it back then, because they, they would have been able to. I mean, I'm saying like that it wouldn't have been uh, an issue in terms of you need to give the yeah. So it, that is a real that's that's crazy to think about. And the other painful part is, of course, we're not 
discovering these skeletons now in Australia. So if you look at um, fossil record in Australia and the dates of the remains, you know, you get this absolute flurry between the 1920s and 1970s, and then it just tails off because people aren't digging. So we have no idea how many remains are out there, which in some sense is good because we always want to preserve more archaeology for those who come after us who have better technology. Um, but it it's also gives you an insight into how the politics of it has worked because, you know, this period where great discoveries are made and then from the 60s to 70s onwards, it begins to, to tail off to almost no fines. And do you think that is, you, you think that's for political reasons or is it simply, um, is it for political reasons, you think? I think, um, that it has to do, I'm, I'm not an expert on Aboriginal tribal law in terms of land control, but oh. I would imagine that it has to do with access to these sites. No, no, no. Uh, even, even like, so, so I know for a fact that in the areas in which you'd want to be digging, um, it's customary now, especially now, it, even, even in certain areas, there's increasingly this expectation that um, even if you're simply visiting the area that, you're expected to um, seek permission from the relevant tribal yeah. authorities. And yeah. yeah, there's no way they're giving, um, yeah, that, yeah, I, I see what you mean, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's why I imagine. So archaeology in Australia will be limited to things like surface remains, ground penetrating radar, and obviously commercial archaeology where it exists. So, you know, you're digging up building foundations and so on that can recover things that way. But where you want to have targeted academic research into somewhere like Lake Mungo or Cow Swamp, you just won't be able to do it anymore. So obviously that means that there's a chance that down the road we, you know, we'll be able to do more. But um, yeah, so... You get things like, just you know, to segue to slightly more contemporary Australian archaeology, you get things like the Lizard Island find that has been in the news for the past couple of weeks. Yeah, that do you want to actually... archaeology, I think, will, will continue. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, ma ma maybe... Um, I'm, I know that you said you're okay to hang around for a little bit longer. I mean, m maybe uh, you could speak even a little bit about that, because w we didn't get into that... Obviously, part of the academic consensus is that Australia is one homogenous group, but also that it remained isolated and had uh, limited trade. You've spoken about um, some things that seem to contradict that. Um, we have the dingo, but uh, recently there's there's been, like you were just starting to explain before I rudely interrupted, there's this uh, lizard okay. island po pottery. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, so... Australian archaeology is in a bit of a bind in one sense because they they don't want to they they want they want Aboriginal Australians to be this culturally rich oldest civilization it's often called you know, the oldest civilization on earth continuous you know profound oral memories from tens of thousands of years ago etc cetera, etc cetera. but they they also have this slightly embarrassing fact that Australian archaeology is also quite boring. I don't want to be too rude, but it's also it, it doesn't evolve in a way that it does around the rest of the world in terms of as the Holocene appears, there is no pottery, there is no farming, there are no monumental architecture, there is no you know great social stratification leading to urbanization, there is no metallurgy. There's a there's a great deal of absence in Australian archaeology, which you end up in this strange position where you have to defend it by saying that this is the oldest civilization. It, you know, they are they are just as talented and as, and as rich and as, as capable as anybody else. But also, we don't have any of those things because we, we have no contact from the outside world. Um, so in the middle of that, we then have to ask the question, why? Was Australia overlooked for some of the, you know, the the great policy developments of agriculture, horticulture, pottery, long distance oceanic sailing, um, all of these sorts of things that begins to occur around the rest of the oceanic region. So we have the 
if we have the Pavaniungan expansion at 3000 BC, we also have the Austronesian expansion. Mm. And by contrast, the Pavaniungan expansion is a landlocked internal migration that involves language change and a change in stone tool types and plant processing. Well, the Austronesian expansion is a juggernaut of development. You know, this is long distance sailing to the point that nobody else has ever replicated this. You know, you're going from the Philippines to Madagascar to Easter Island to Micronesia. Um, you're bringing entirely wholesale domesticate crop packages with you. You know, we've got we've got roots, we've got eventually rice, we've got uh, you know dogs, we've got pigs, we've got coconuts, bananas, taro, all of these amazing things. And they just they you know it begins to spread across Southeast Asia, into Madagascar, across the Indian Ocean, across Polynesia, all the way to South America, somehow completely misses Australia. Australia is just this void in the Austronesian world. And so I wrote an entire piece trying to get to the bottom of, because not many archaeologists have even asked the question, why did Australia get overlooked by the Austronesian expansion? Why did that happen? We stood they go to Torres Strait. Was um the Torres Strait visited by the Austronesians? Well, yeah, half of half of the Torres Strait Islanders are Austronesian in their language and their their ancestry, mm. but it never hits mainland Australia. And so when I went looking for um, evidence that the Austronesians had visited, there is a little bit of evidence. There are. Things like, for example, there's wild taro in northern Australia. Why is it there? There's wild bamboo in Australia. Why is that there? There's Australian crickets who have found their way to Polynesia. Not entirely sure how that happened. Mm. Um, and one of the other things that you do get only around the very edges of Australia is very crude pottery. And Lizard Island, which is very, very tiny island off the uh the east coast I'm trying to think where lizard island is it's in Great the coral Island, sea coral yeah. sea area all right yep yeah so you, lizard island is surrounded by some even smaller ones um you we found uh some pottery on lizard island and then the question of course occurs is who made that mm. um the evidence i think and i presented in in the essay is overwhelming that it's a case of um, Austronesian Lapita culture visitation into the um, into Australian waters. But there was a paper that was published a few weeks ago, which in which they have claimed, and I don't really think they've managed to back up their claim, but they want it to be Aboriginal pottery. They, they quite desperately wanted to be Aboriginal pottery. Now it's it's relatively crude. It's made with local resources. It's not imported pottery, um, but that is in keeping with how the Austronesians made their pottery. So they made it from whatever they, they had to hand. Um, and there's com extensive computer modeling, and there's um, also a lot of other sort of ephemeral bits of archaeology in the island, which suggests that Lizard Island was occupied by Aboriginal peoples, but also visited and was within the sort of... Um, because, you know, the Austronesians are a people that, that lived on the sea and they lived to trade and move between different places. You know, if you if you're able to sail to Madagascar from Indonesia, then you must love being on the sea. If you're able to sail to Easter Island, then you've, that, that's, that's the way that you live. So they were moving around the coast of Australia, probably following things like the turtle hunt um, and made contact with Australians, Aboriginal Australians on Lizard Island. What we don't have is any evidence of that on the mainland so then it is a question of why did they get on did they not get on was there a failed attempts at colonization which i think probably happened small attempts at colonization but the genetics from the torres strait is pretty definitive that there was very little intermixing between aboriginal and austronesian and papuan peoples mm. But but the Austronesians are present in the Torres Strait. It's interesting because talking it's, about the, the homogenization, right, is um, the 
like in Australia, it'll always be like uh, like, like Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders are mentioned in the yes. same sentence, and That's they're treated right, yeah. like more or less the same people. And most people don't realize is no, the Torres Strait Islanders are very different. Like they had undergone the, the Neolithic or farming revolution. And another thing that people forget is that like relations between um, the like Europeans and the Torres Strait Islanders was much more positive. I believe that Torres Strait Islanders are like, um, they have a day called like the coming of the light. And that commemorates <laughs> like the missionaries arriving because they're a highly Christian population. So yeah. the, the, the what will happen is like that they tried to, they're constantly getting like, people are trying to rope them into like, you know, this sort of like uh, ethnic resentment, race politics, but um, they, they're never really that interested in it because it, it's yeah they're, they're just a very different people um uh and, and the austronesian influence uh that that is interesting the it is just so powerful as well there's a yeah. mix there there's some languages in the torres that are there's the merriam language um and there's a sort of there's the creole and then there's languages like um kalau lagawiya however you pronounce it anyway there's there's a, it, it's an interesting group of islands because it is this blend of Australian Papuan and Austronesian. You you think about you think about um all the seafaring peoples in in Southeast Asia. You know, I, I mentioned the, the you know the the, Mac the Macassar people who obviously came in the 17th century searching for sea cucumbers. Um, but you can't help but think with all these seafarers, surely surely contact was made at some point, like a. Uh, I, like you think about the, the way that the Europeans would describe, like like the British would describe uh, Malays as some of the bravest seafarers, um, and, and you mentioned the Austronesians. So I I feel like that is also something that that um suggests that contact could have been made. It seems inevitable, doesn't it? That you know you have um you have this civilization that emerges from contacts between small islands, island chains, and archipelagos, which expands outwards to becoming, you know, the Austronesians were a trading people who brought cloves to Syria in, you know, 1000 BC or whatever it was. You know, you, you're talking about connections across a vast scale. There are, there are, there's, been a discussion about whether the Austronesians were a kind of link between the new and the old world before mm. Europeans crossed the Atlantic. You did, you know, did was there a kind of a, a Polynesian sort of highway almost that made it from South America, Mesoamerica, back through the Pacific, all the way into into the old world? And there's and this is a topic I'm writing about at the moment, but there are numerous plants that turned up in the old world way earlier than they have any right to um things like polynesian connections with japan um just remarkable stuff in terms of their ability to sail and wherever they found themselves to sort of create themselves set themselves up as a trading people who controlled the secrets of of the sea you know and to colonize madagascar and to move to the east coast of Africa and potentially, you know, how did bananas get to Africa? Well, that, you know, that's the Austronesians. They're moving things around. The great movers on the sea. They're from Taiwan. Then you have Australia. The, yeah, the, the original the original movement came from from Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's always been a lot of debate about that, but genetically, it's been settled as being being Taiwan. And, but then, and like I say, you have Australia. Then there's just this complete opposite. You know, it, it, enigmatic continent that seems to be basically landlocked and isolated. And the Aboriginal peoples, while there are certainly canoes and certainly some tradition of, of you know, uh, seafaring around around coastal areas and obviously connections with the Torres, they have no great culture of expansive, exploratory trading and ocean ocean voyaging at all it seems inconceivable that an island as not an island as continent like australia would just be missed by by this the most ocean going people on earth probably to have ever existed that yeah it does seem crazy it does seem crazy i think it's funny reading uh you read captain cook's description of aboriginal 
canoes. It's not very nice. I think he said they're like the worst he's ever seen. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's, yeah, there's always been this debate about whether they they basically lost sailing technology, um, which you know is is an interesting idea. I imagine that they were certainly capable of sailing to the coral reefs, to places like Lizard Island. There are thousands of islands around Australia, which they must have been able to to get to and to you know to make use of the um, sea resources. But for whatever reason, that never translated into developing sails or outriggers or anything else that would take them further away from from their shores um and it's some uh, it's the kind of ephemeral part of cultural psychology which which you just is very difficult to discuss academically and also very difficult to put your finger on but you know you you hear tales of um you know when cook arrived when europeans arrived in tahiti and hawaii and you know polynesians would would jump on the ships and mm. would go with them, and they became, you know, they were they were genuinely intrigued and excited about what the world was that these ships could bring them to this wider, this you know, this bigger, wider world. And the Maori, who were Polynesian people, the same, you know, the second they got a chance, it was we are going to volunteer for the war, we're going to go, you know, we're going to go overseas, etc. The Aboriginal Australians have always seemed parochial in that regard, and well, I don't know what quirk of psychology. Or whatever cultural factors make it make it so, but they have always seemed more interested in the internal part of Australia, you know, the inside, the land, the you know, whatever the the mythological landscape of Australia that has drawn them there, and less interested in the coast and the sea. One of the things that I found almost impossible to comprehend, and this is in multiple um, journals, is. You have Europeans sailing in on, uh, you know, boats that are larger than tennis courts, you know, like without a doubt, the biggest man-made structure the indigenous people would have ever seen. And as they sail into Botany Bay, they're barely glanced at, barely look. And that's, that's, that's not just like one journal entry from Banks and Cook, but actually like a theme that comes up on a number of occasions where these big ships arrive and there'll be fishermen who barely move their head to look. They're totally disinterested. I, I, I do not know what that's about, but how do you make sense of that? Very weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Once you start getting into the psychology of peoples and when you overlay that with things like animistic interpretations of the world, you can read accounts like the Paraha people where you just end up completely, you know, adrift in terms of how you comprehend the world when you start with and that's what anthropology should be doing right that's mm. that's what a good anthropology should be doing it should be offering up these descriptions these rich descriptions of people and 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 forcing you to to encounter an, a completely different alien radically different way of life and to try and make sense of that and and you will relativize your own position in some way and that's that's normal and natural um which is just utterly unlike the anthropology that we have today. Yeah, I feel like that's a good way to almost wrap it up because I, I genuinely do feel I've been I've been I've really loved this conversation. I've uh, and I do yeah, feel, feel feel like that um that sense of the alien and also just that sense of like a uh, awe and interest like um yeah definitely captured it. So I I, I feel like that's yeah it, even um this conversation I feel like has been a great example of like you know what anthropology should be like if you feel like you're going on a, on a journey and actually um going going yeah go, going into to, to alien territory i like that like that, that's pretty much um what you just said that's how it's felt this alien unusual territory which um yeah absolutely is what anthropology should be about and it's kind of like i said before i feel like globalization um uh the fact that you can fly from one side of the world to the other and it doesn't feel that different there's this real uh yearning to um for the alien and i really feel like that's what you're doing with your work so really keep it up i think i think it's fantastic stuff you know um th there's a yearning for for the alien and i think that you captured that in, in the work that you're doing so thank you so much thank for the time to chat with me that's a lot of people say that that's the thing that they get out of my writing is just that the world is not as boring 
or as disenchanted or as, um, yeah, just as monotonous or domesticated as it's made out to be. So if I can pass along that that sense in, um, you know, in an essay, then I feel like I've done my job. And yeah. um, I really appreciate opportunities like this, discussions like this, to be able to, you know, become passionate and pass along, try and get some of that energy over that these topics are not dead or dry um, and that they're full of mystery, full of opportunity. And it just takes people to off their own back, just begin the research and you'll, you'll realize how much we, we don't know about things that there is a great consensus about. So I really appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Uh, if you have me back, I would definitely do it again. Yeah, let's do it again. Well, let's absolutely do it again. Okay, Stone Age Herbalist. Thank you.